Next, uh, we're going to move on to uh, a wonderful uh, panel, and it's uh, with Norvartis. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, the video and then to Ann Arts, who is uh, head of the foundation and uh, for a very interesting discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Ransel, for the nice introduction. And it's with great pleasure that um, I'm moderating today this panel on reimagining global health through artificial intelligence, the roadmap to AI maturity and health. And um, with uh, honor to introduce our esteemed panelists today, uh, I see we have everyone online. So our first panelist is uh, Derek Munene, who is the Head of Capacity Building and Collaboration at the World Health Organization. Hi, Derek. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. The second panelist is um, uh, Tracy McNeil, who is our, the VP of Clinical Governance and Quality at Babylon Health. Hello, Tracy. Thank you for joining. Hi, and welcome. Everyone. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. And our third panelist is uh, Dr. Sujoy Carr, who is the Chief Medical Information Officer and VP at Apollo Hospitals in India. Thank you so much, Sujoy, for uh, yeah. making Thank you so much, Sujoy, for... And the fourth uh, panelist and, uh, is Lick Merritt, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Penn Signature Services, Penn Medicine. Welcome to all of the panelists. So let me introduce this discussion by uh, telling you a little bit what this report of the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development Working Group on AI in Health has been looking at. So in fact, the report um, started with making a full global landscape analysis of what kind of impact AI is already having on the health of millions of people. And we found out um, throughout uh, deeper diving into 300 examples of AI in health in the world that AI doesn't only have a, an impact on clinical care, as we know very well about the image-based diagnosis, how that can help physicians to make their diagnosis more accurate and faster, but AI has an, has an impact across five top use cases. The first one being population health, and uh, we were very lucky to have these examples already from before the COVID uh, pandemic, as uh, UNICEF, for example, had developed a, a fantastic solution that bring, um, brought machine learning towards uh, data on specific diseases, uh, diseases that usually occur in epidemics, and help countries to respond better to those epidemics with their magic box solution. So that was um, absolutely proving very useful during the beginning of the COVID crisis as well. So in population health, there are several fantastic examples like this. The second uh, top use case is in R&D, how AI can accelerate drug discovery and drug development by changing the way we um, scan our existing library of drugs and um, identify pathways to address in different diseases, but also how we can perform our clinical trials much faster now. The third uh, big use case is obviously clinical care, and we know the image-based diagnosis, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, but there's other wonderful examples of that, and one of those will, is uh, represented here by Dr. Sujoy um, from Apollo Hospitals in India, and I'm not going to say what, what it is all about, but um, let Dr. Sujoy tell you about it. The fourth top use case is uh, our patient-facing solutions, so like uh, chatbots or 
other solutions that can help uh, patients at, um, seek healthcare where they don't necessarily have access to a healthcare professional. So a lot of existing uh, fantastic solutions that have a real impact on the health of many people, also in low and middle income countries, because I must say that many of these 300 examples came from low and middle income countries. And the last uh, big top use case is how AI can already optimize the way health systems function. Uh, we know AI helps us with better planning our supply chains or cold chains, but it can also help us really um, make better human resource planning. And we know that that is a big need in uh, specifically around the world in low and middle income countries where we face drastic shortages of skilled healthcare professionals. And um, we can only um, improve the capabilities of humans if we use the machines in addition to the human expertise. So the, the message of the report is really that Artificial intelligence brings an added value to the human expertise. Humans plus machines deliver better outcomes for patients. It's not necessarily a replacement of humans, but an improvement of the expertise that is um, uh, within our, um, our capabilities currently. So based on all of these top use cases, we then looked at what the challenges and enablers were for those to get to scale. And we translated that in a systemized way that countries can um, tap into to understand what are the areas they need to invest in, in priority, to, to make sure that they advance on their readiness to deploy artificial intelligence in their health systems. And that is what makes out the roadmap towards maturity in health. And six equally important interdependent areas came out of that um, translation of the landscape analysis. The first and foremost important area is people and workforce, increasing digital capabilities around the entire population, but specifically in the health and tech workforce is absolutely key. So governments need to improve the educational opportunities that are both pre-service and during service of the health workforce for data science and AI. The second um, main uh, area of investment needed to advance on, on uh, preparing the ecosystem to introduce AI in the health system are uh, data and infrastructure. Obviously there we need to have broadband connection first and foremost and currently unfortunately still 46% of the world is unconnected and this is um, in the frame of the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development a universal call to increase that coverage and um, get make sure that the entire world has access to digital services. So that is absolutely a sine qua non condition for advancing on the maturity towards AI in health, but also the, the availability of data, the quality of data, and the, the fact that data shouldn't be isolated in silos of data sets that cannot be um, talking to each other where machines cannot learn from, so they need to be made interoperable. The third area is obviously governance and regulatory systems that are absolutely key to make sure we maximize the AI opportunities while we have to keep people safe by introducing the necessary privacy and security layers. The fourth area to focus on for a government is really making sure that in the design, every AI solution that is developed is based on an existing priority health need. If that's not a needs-driven solution, won't get to scale. So that's also a sine qua non for successful, uh, sustainable, scalable solutions in AI. And the second one is obviously how we introduce those um, needs-driven and human-centered design solutions into the existing health processes. And Tracy is going to give us a fantastic example of that, how Babel went forward with that um, to introduce it, to integrate uh, the whole innovative solution into the existing workflow of uh, the health workforce. And then the, the next um, area that the country needs to think of to invest is obviously um, partnerships, as no one can do this alone. Everybody has to work together. Um, we already know it from the digital health space. If the government doesn't take that coordinated approach to streamline innovations that they are 
corresponding to their priority needs, we end up with a fragmented landscape. And we've seen that in the digital health space, so we have to avoid to get there within um, the AI integration in health systems. And lastly, sustainable business models are key to scale. And uh, if governments don't have the necessary funding available to guarantee that, they have to open up to innovative ways of incentivizing uh, innovations, innovative ways of monetizing data and the assets that come out of it, or innovative funding mechanisms. So these were the six pillars for the roadmap towards AI maturity in health. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion with our um, esteemed panelists uh, to see what are of these pillars have been the most important uh, related to their work and what were the key success factors that we can learn from the field of what it takes to scale uh, a proven successful innovation and also what it takes for uh, low-income settings to leapfrog innovations from high-income settings, but potentially also the reverse innovation. How can high-income countries leapfrog from innovations uh, coming from low- and middle-income settings? So that is uh, what we will be discussing today. And maybe I can start with uh, you, Derek. Derek, as the WHO uh, coordinating authority on public health in the world, you have a key role to play in both providing these policy guidances, but also in the capability building um, of the countries as they embark on their journey towards uh, inter integrating AI in the health systems. Uh -huh. So, but there is also a need, and I know WHO calls for that, to bridge the hype surrounding artificial intelligence and make sure that we really deliver actual health outcomes for patients. So how uh, we know that regulatory systems can hamper the scale of innovative solutions, but we also need to build enough trust so that solutions um, are not um, feared of, and there's not too much resistance of the ones who have to adopt the solutions because they are not leading to those positive health outcomes. Can you tell us a bit of how we can find that right balance between the regulatory systems we need to have in place, but also to scale proven solutions rapidly um, throughout the world? Thank you so much, uh, uh, Anne. And to just uh, perform a sound check, can you hear me correctly? Am yes, I clear? Very well, thank you. All right. Firstly, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for such a fantastic session that is dealing with an appropriate topic at the right time, uh, given the current uh, situation we're having around COVID. And indeed, uh, the pandemic has been quite catastrophic. We recognize that digital health is uh, a major you know, uh, contributor towards the short-term uh, mitigation uh, activities and also for uh, the long term. Um, throughout uh, the digital health, um, you know, uh, maturity and preparation of countries, WHO has been heavily engaged uh, with member states. We are presently releasing uh, the global digital health strategy that came as a result of um, a WHO resolution in 2018, as proposed by one of our member states, uh, India, and. Uh, that resolution, of course, uh, builds on um, you know, earlier resolutions and instruments. Uh, we definitely have seen um, uh, a strong correlation between the eight pillars and that you've just described with some of our early instruments, such as the National E-Health Toolkit that promised you know, foundations of national strategies based upon seven pillars, uh, including regulations for digital health, uh, including services and applications, standards and operability, health workforce capacity building, strategy and governance. Uh, the, the nomenclature might be different from what you've discussed, but the spirit of the nomenclature are the same. So your report is very timely. It takes us forward. Uh, within the space of artificial intelligence, um, this is a core area uh, that the organization has been investing in. Uh, we have taken, you know, concrete steps in terms of uh, making sure that countries are able to uptake this um, new area in health, uh, albeit this area has been around for a long time, but we're beginning to introduce this in health. One of the key issues there in this particular space is uh, the need to ensure that um, the uh, algorithms that are used in AI and the performance matrices are well you know, uh, are supported, especially by governments. 
Uh, of course, modern AI algorithms are quite complex and the performance really depends on the quality of the training data as well as the learning mechanisms uh, that are used. And so if these algorithms are poorly designed and the training data are also biased, incomplete and error prone, the results might be unpredictable. And so the two uh, areas that we're uh, supporting is uh, one, making sure that the ethics and the regulatory site is well catered for. We have an AI uh, focus group with the ITU that is uh, working on eight, uh, 11 streams. And really they're looking at ethics in AI and regulation so as to prepare member states uh, to keep up with the hype, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Anne. There's a lot of hype around. And so as with all technologies, normally regulations come after you know, proof of concepts have been established, such as you've done in your report. So that's one stream of work that we are busy working with our member states and uh, UN agencies. And the Thank you, of course. Derek. Derek, and I just pick up on the, uh, this point you make is so important. Uh, I know about the task force between uh, ITU and uh, WHO on um, working on that benchmarking of AI solutions that actually bring a positive health outcome. Uh, uh, Can you tell us how that works? What the task force does? Yeah, sure. This is a very important point. So the WHO ITU task force, uh, as I mentioned, is, is a really uh, a collaborative um, you know, activity between the WHO and the ITU. Uh, and so we have 11 uh, work streams there. And uh, part of the you know, discussion points are around the use case development of uh, artificial intelligence. So we have use cases around, uh, for example, use of images for retinotherapy, uh, detection of cancer diseases, a cervical cancer. We have two um, uh, work products that we are busy with, uh, which is around cervical cancer and also detection of heart diseases and conditions. Uh, and so this is a routine um, a body and really the generation of evidence and what member states need to do to govern AI is part of the focus of that working group. Fantastic. Tracy, that brings me to you. In fact, um, uh, in your solution, the telehealth solution, you were already partnering with um, the government in Rwanda and many other countries. But I take the, the Rwanda example as that was also showcased in the report. But within that solution, you added artificial intelligence to augment the capabilities of the call responders or also to um, offer a faster response for, for people who need um, telehealth services. Can you tell us a little bit um, about how that functions and how it is so useful given that there is an, an enormous shortage of qualified health professionals in Rwanda? How did you, went, did you go about this? Sure. Um, um, thank you, Anne, and, and thank you to everyone for putting together um, this panel. And um, um, I'm delighted to be here today talking about AI. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Babylon um, is a global provider of healthcare in um, AI and digital services. And our, our mission is very simple, which is to put affordable and accessible healthcare into the hands of everyone globally. Very easy to say and much harder to do. Uh, and I, I guess I work in Rwanda um, started when uh, the government of Rwanda asked us to come to Rwanda and set up a digital healthcare solution about three and a half, four years ago. Um, and so I think there's a few things I'd want to kind of draw out from our very practical and operational experiences that, you know, the first thing we had to do was if you're going to develop a virtual healthcare system uh, for the first time, then you have to look at how the physical system works and, and how patients flow through a bricks and mortar type healthcare service. And then how do you replicate that in a, in a virtual way? And so most people think you're just replicating a digital consultation, so a phone consultation, for example, but it's a, it's a lot more than that. It's about how do you register patients? How do you verify them? Um, how do you take payment if there's a co-payment? How do you make sure that they're covered by the universal health coverage scheme or some form of insurance scheme? So you have to look at every step in that patient journey and recreate it virtually. So that was our starting point. We then, um, obviously, as you mentioned earlier, smartphone penetration is very low in, in generally in low and middle income countries and particularly low at that time in Rwanda. So we needed to take as much functionality as we could from our smartphone and put that onto a feature phone. So that was another challenge for us. 
I think the important thing when you're doing something for the first time and it's very much the ethos within Babylon is that you can never do that alone. And as pulled out in the Broadband Commission report, partnerships are really critical to that. And so we had to look to other agencies, other government bodies to help us in, in a truly public private sector collaboration. And I thank the government of Rwanda for their foresight and their assistance in doing that because it, it wasn't easy for anyone. And I think that um, you know, through that partnership, you can achieve some great things that you think are, are just not possible. So now um, we're using AI as part of the triage function. So if you think about the pyramid of healthcare in Rwanda, at the base of the pyramid are community-based health workers who provide very basic healthcare advice, but very effectively. So in our virtual pyramid, the first entry point for a patient is a digital triage call. And we were using nurses to um, deliver those consultations. Now with AI and our AI model is becoming more and more sophisticated as it develops more and more um, epi local epidemiology in Rwanda and becomes much more sensitive to the thousands of flows we put through it. Then the next stage in our journey is to put AI into the hands of non-healthcare providers, which again, as you mentioned Anne earlier, is, is, is really sparing the scarce resources of nurses and doctors to deal with conditions that, that can't be dealt with through AI and a chatbot. And our chatbot helps signpost patients um, in terms of whether they require a digital consultation or a consultation with either a nurse or a doctor. And the next stage of our journey in partnership with the government of Rwanda, we work closely with the Gates Foundation, for instance, um, is that we want to put that AI chatbot into uh, community health posts and health centers. And then our real dream that we won't give up until we've actually done that is to put it into the hands of community-based health workers. And then you can imagine that you've then got a community-based health worker who really has a doctor's brain in their hands on some type of tablet or smartphone. And I think then you can really begin to make real change to outcomes at community-based level. So that, that's how we're using AI, that's our journey, that's how we started. And it's very much a partnership and many, many people have been involved in that journey with us and continue to do so. Thank you, Tracy. I'll definitely come back on that point on the partnership because this is a real great example of how you work, uh, work as a private sector company with the government of Rwanda. It's really fabulous. And all the other stakeholders you brought you. into the ecosystem. Um, but maybe uh, um, let me move to you, Dr. Sujoy. Um, for in Apollo hospitals, you have been partnering together with Microsoft um, to develop a specific heart score, score or a risk score, I would say, for detecting uh, heart attacks and other cardiovascular events earlier than you could with the classic uh, cardiovascular risk scores that were based on the good old Framingham cohort analysis and, and are not necessarily adapted for the Indian population. So you now use that to redefine how you, pro you provide preventive services to the general population in India. But uh, tell us a bit about uh, that new risk score you developed and how um, it demonstrates the power of federated learning in, uh, in India, in India already, but you go global with it now as well, please. Tell us a bit about that. Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, first of all, um, am I audible? Right. Uh, so the, um, we started uh, about a couple of years back uh, looking at the uh, records that we have patients coming and doing their regular health checks at uh, the hospital to see if they have had uh, any cardiovascular event, uh, acute coronary syndrome, acute myocardial infarction, uh, and so on and so forth. And when we looked at this data, we had close to uh, you know, 100 uh, parameters. Dr. Uh, but we zeroed it down with the help of deep learning to 21 parameters. And uh, we... 
Hello. Doctor Sujor, you're you're going up and down. Right. The connection so, is not um, good. Maybe you can close the video for a little bit if that works better with less bounce. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, it was uh, so we uh, we looked at the accuracy um, and the the, um, the effectivity of this. Uh, um, uh, the effectivity of this AI model that we had uh, developed. And we found that it was, uh, you know, uh, many times better than what we were seeing conventional Framingham or curious in Indian population. And then, um, you know, we use this uh, integrated the clinical pathway with it and um, uh, used it for about close to half a million people uh, prospectively to see if we could select uh, people who would have, um, you know, So Joy, you're, you're, we are losing you had uh, cardiac, uh, what were they, with, you know, whether they were in a moderate or high risk, they would go follow up uh, with the cardiologist to see, you know, uh, and prevent uh, uh, and act on their modifiable factor. Now, coming to your point on federated learning, we took this model to... Um, Sujo, we lost you. Okay. Hello. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah, yeah. You can use this uh, model uh, in almost the same action through the um, Azure uh, powered, uh, you know, uh, federated learning, where the data did not have to move to us. Uh, it was done through, you know, the algorithm. Algorithm. Yeah. Sujo, we really cannot understand you. Uh, could you speak in short sentences or go to an, an area where you have, if possible, get a stable uh, connection? We could, you know, we, where we could do um, to 15,000 people on. Uh, uh, Sujo, do you hear me? The so uh, 15,000 people on. So that is what we were seeing as a power of. So, so Joy, do you hear me? <laughs> I think. I think it is. Uh, may, maybe right. I can. So Joy, we we lost I mean, you for the, the the relevance that we the impact. So Joy. I I don't think. Um, uh, yes. I, can Sujoy, hear you. I think, yeah, we lost you uh, for a lot of the things you said. So maybe you, if you can go to an area where you have a more stable connection um, and then we come back to you. Let me in a minute um, go to our next panelist, maybe for a minute. Mick, uh, Sujoy, if at all possible, if you can find a better place. Um, Mick, so Penn Medicine is one of the largest academic health centers in the U.S. known for research and development of new treatments. And your innovation team recently focused on how you can apply AI to provide better care in the U.S. So you also recently, in that frame, collaborated with Google to, to make a, an AI chatbot and help answering common questions related to COVID-19. But um, I look forward to hearing a bit more about what Penn is doing in this space. Can you, can you describe some of the main uh, areas you've been working on? Sure. Um, thank you, Anne and uh, Ransel C3 for organizing all of this. Um, Penn Medicine, really, when we think about um, the AI space, and in particular within our health system medical school, where our innovation group is really focused within AI, we really are focusing first on design and process, which, and as I told you in preparation for this, I really think that the work that the Novartis Foundation and others did with this Barmore piece is really quite, quite a great piece of work um, on this space. But I would say that the work that we're doing really focused on clinical care process and design, and ultimately us looking for ways that we can leverage AI to improve uh, care, truly making it better. But in thinking about that, 
The way we really focus on it is looking at, you know, when we think of AI, you tend to think of algorithms or ways that you're kind of moving somebody through kind of an automated series of steps. And what we really are focusing on is not just the, um, the data or logic driven, you know, components of that, which are very important, but more on what we view, you know, AI as being one that allows us to think about, you know, a conversation and how we can leverage digital language processing in order to engage with an individual and capture much more than just a yes, no, or an input uh, function. And the way I tend to think about it and kind of in the framing as we got started around allowing healthcare to be proactive is that there's lots of ways that now are becoming much more widely used where we can, for example, inform, in this case, I'll frame it in terms of a patient or an individual, potentially engage or get them to follow up. But the real trick is how can we actually deliver care um, and ultimately improve the outcome of what we're trying to do. And so in focusing on you know, how we can leverage AI in terms of uh, language processing, we basically have pulled together groups of clinicians, or data scientists, and language experts. And we've then had, we focused on several clinical areas now in the last few years. Um, and I was gonna to touch on three of them, but there's been six that are uh, pretty far along, each of which have a really powerful example of how AI can truly um, improve care. And ultimately the one, the way I, we, we talk about this, um, and I really like, and it resonates with me, is that we're trying to use AI in a way that allows for automated hovering. So you're truly extending the care team. You're not just triaging inputs. Um, and so if you think of automated hovering as I work through a few examples, I think you'll understand both kind of what that may mean and ultimately how powerful truly it can be. Um, so one of the first that we focused on was oral chemotherapy and delivery of oral chemotherapy in the home. Um, and a shift from, you know, traditionally that being done in um, an infusion center where you have access to lots of resources, really if something goes wrong. And so the question was, how can we work with an individual to manage a complex uh, regimen that requires, you know, significant follow-up and medica medication adherence and inputs along the way? And could we in fact do that from being in the home without having somebody basically dedicated um, to monitoring it? And so what we ultimately did was work through all the various aspects during for the care process for specific drugs and then the timing of those, and then developed a tool that would allow us to be able to uh, basically have a conversation with that individual about what was going on with that care process. And in doing this, by the way, the tool that we use, and for all of these examples, this is the common set, is texting, which in the US, um, you know, SMS texting is uh, pervasive and simple. So we're using text purely for all of this so far to date. And we integrate this texting or this conversation uh, into the medical record. And so if you're a provider you know, at Penn Medicine, you will then be able to, see, anyone on the care team can see what the patient was responding to and what the questions were being asked. Um, so when you do focus on the individual, you can then see the richness of uh, what's been transpiring. And so ultimately we were able to prove um, is that we could effectively manage patients on oral chemotherapies in the home um, and do that in a way where the patients um, felt safe, they valued being able to be in the home versus having to come to an infusion center, which could be you know, significant travel, not to mention the time. And ultimately we proved internally that we were significantly reducing ER visits. Um, in the first 10 that they were studied that they're uh, published around, we reduced four ER visits, which separate from the cost or impact of that, just from a personal experience point of view, to be that scared to then be driven to, to want to go to an ED versus by then us being able to prompt, for example, based on answers to then get an on-call oncology physician to be able to contact and interact with the patient or a nurse on the care team, that's how we're managing it. And so often you can actually work through with the patient what to do without the answer uh -huh. into the emergency room. Um, and second, as Ann touched on, when COVID hit, and by the way, COVID impacted this, this area of work because managing oral chemotherapy, once we were proving this was successful and then COVID hit, we increased our volume significantly because we developed some comfort level and the hospital leadership um, decided that was uh, appropriate and, of course, would minimize exposure risk for COVID. So it turned out to be one of these things that, uh, with COVID, actually allowed us to really push it to another level as far as numbers of individuals that we were Fantastic. managing this way. And um, it will it continue after COVID even more, I guess. Yes, and absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then related to COVID, there are really two things that we uh, focused on. Um, the first, which is more kind of a, I guess I don't use the word traditional, but more of an algorithmic based approach was simply 
for example, if, if the patient were to interact on our website to have essentially a chat bot that would ask questions. Um, and ultimately this allowed us to really triage um, and be able to determine which individuals really may need to be either seen or have someone reach out to. Um, and so we did develop that. And we had significant success from, at least from our view, but also from patient feedback around this, that it was you know, a useful tool that really could triage to what ultimately were relatively simple um, indicators for when somebody really needed to access care, which in the US, separate from the exorbitancy of our numbers of COVID cases and where we're at um, as a country, we did not have the ability to you know, test significantly. So we truly were being thoughtful around who was tested and also where they were tested. Um, so the chatbot was definitely a useful tool, but more importantly, what we developed was something called COVID Watch, which is um, now you know, publicly available. You can find a website with information on it. But essentially, the point of COVID Watch was, could, can we actually use AI in order to manage patients who are either being monitored or through a quarantine period of 14 days, or in fact are COVID positive, but then we could potentially manage much better in the home to, again, minimize exposure and minimize the need to access resources. And ultimately, we were able to do this um, effectively. And of all the science and work that was done, our innovation officer said it really came down to one of the most simple things as far as COVID is concerned. It really drove when we needed to either have a provider speaking with the patient and or advise someone to come to an ED. And that was uh, difficulty breathing. Um, and so the, the AI tool actually allows much more richness, even down to psychosocial indicators through it. But ultimately, that was the one significant trigger, which you can imagine like an individual, there may be a series of things with COVID that they're concerned about, symptoms, et cetera, because of the overlap across multiple things. But ultimately, what's going to drive you know, care specifically related to COVID and or be a risk for a patient who may need to truly come to a hospitalized setting in order to, um, to be cared for. And we've basically managed 5,000 patients between the chatbot now and the uh, COVID watch at home. So it's also got some scale aspect to it. Um, albeit, you know, we're one medical center and system, although we, we are pretty large. We treat about a million individuals a year um, in our system, but ultimately we're a localized health system versus a government looking at some of the larger ways to use AI. Um, another small example, but it, oh, sorry. Maybe we, we come back to you, Mika. This is, these are all fantastic examples, and surely um, many of those are useful for many other countries as well, as you were describing. And Derek, I saw you uh, nodding, in fact, on um, when um, Mick was explaining on the design how you have to bring together the different types of stakeholders so that there is really um, a co-creation in that from the partnership who built it so that it yeah. will be taken up afterwards. But in uh, global health as such, there is also uh, to leverage the power of AI and, and use it to accelerate the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Then we need also new types of partnerships. And I think um, you're, um, you are launching now or in the next coming days a new network of networks of digital and AI partners. So can you tell us a bit about that, Derek? Yeah, thanks, Anne. And you're definitely right. I was nodding as uh, 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 Mike was speaking, and I'll just spend a few seconds to just echo some of the things he's mentioned. So previously, within the global network, uh, it was recognized that we needed, um, you know, some kind of guiding frameworks for the promotion of digital health. A number of pieces came out, such as the um, principles of digital development uh, that have been success success successfully used in the promotion of digital health uh, strategies and implementation. And the first principle there, you know, is designed with a user co-creation. And then at the global level, one of the realizations that we've picked up consistent with the aspirations of the digital health resolution is partnerships. So in the heart of the resolution is a call for partnerships. Uh, this is the same call that the Broadband Commission, I think in 2017, appealed when it called for partnership, partnerships. Arrangements within the governments between the uh, ministries of health and ministries of ICT. So at the global level, right now, we're really trying to reduce the fragmentation and consolidate existing efforts through what we call a network of networks. Uh, there are different networks there of different types, sizes, and breadth. And in fact, there are also network of networks within the networks. And so what we're preparing is an ecosystem, uh, a global network of networks that brings together different actors from the member states themselves uh, to the donors, to the NGOs, to the private sector, the academia, the NGOs, you know, the different you know, civil societies 
And so we have so far have had interactions with um, you know, three of these groups and we're yet to have some interactions with the remaining two or three groups. And the idea of course is to culminate with a, a, a paper, a discussion paper towards the end of the year that teases out key issues coming out of these different networks. Um, and so the goal is to consolidate uh, existing efforts uh, in such a way that we build a global network that's both inclusive and also representative. As you rightly mentioned, uh, uh, mentioned Anne, the, the SDGs cannot be achieved uh, without concerted efforts of everybody. And at the same time, we cannot achieve universal health coverage without being able to leverage the power that exists in different networks. So we're preparing a network of networks and, and this particular network is intended to fast track the SDGs you know, fast track universal health coverage, fast track our 13th general program of work in such a way that we are all consolidated. I just want to add one African proverb there, and uh, we like to say in Africa that if you want to go fast, uh, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. That's uh, my one of my favorite sayings, or if not my favorite one. Thank you, Derek. And I, I think I cannot agree more that um, this new way of partnering together is the only way to fast track our, our road towards achieving the different sustainable development goals, but particularly one the one on health. And Tracy, I said I would com come back to you on partnerships, and I will come back to you after uh, Dr. Stujoy because I see you're back online. But Tracy, you built this partnership between the private sector and the um, public sector in Rwanda, but you also brought in um, other agencies like the National Identification Agency or the broadband providers, telecom in industry. Can you tell us how you accompanied the government in, in their digital journey, if you may, because it was a journey, right? Yeah, it's not, it certainly was a journey and, and, and still is, and we're, we're still learning together and it's a very fruitful relationship. Um, so we, as I mentioned earlier, we, we needed to do a lot of system integration, a lot of partnerships. So when, when I looked at how we were going to register patients and how we would know whether they were covered in the universal health coverage scheme, which is called Mutual as an example, then we, uh, we discovered that the National Identification Agency in Rwanda um, has national IDs on everyone and it's also linked to their SIM card. So that was one of those ha-ha moments where we went, okay, so if we can do a system integration with NIDA, then we're able to identify someone, we're able to verify them. And that helped us reduce issues like fraud and making sure that on a digital platform, we're talking to the person that who they say they are. And another system integration and another partnership was working with um, the telcos. So uh, we were really clear from day one that we weren't going to have any exclusive relationships with any one um, telco provider. We wanted to make sure that Babel was available on all the networks across, across Rwanda and that you shouldn't be unable to access digital healthcare just because you had a different network provider. Um, and the networks were eventually were very receptive to that and we treated them all again as equal partners. And you know, one of the things I remember really vividly was that it took us about, um, about six months to get about half a million users on, on our platform. And we were delighted with that, that adoption curve. And today we have about two and a half million Rwandans using our platform and we've done a million consultations. Um, so we've learned a lot about scaling, but, but going back to one of the telcos, it, it took us six months to get 500 people on that platform, uh, uh, half a million people on that platform, and then we got a million new users within 24 hours, and that was just through integrating with one of the network providers and offering Babbel directly to all of their subscribers. So we learned a lot about how you can fast track things, um, how technology can help leapfrog and move you forward to sustainability and, and scale. But, you know, again, to my point earlier, public-private sector partnership is so important. If you, if you try and go it alone, as, as, as we heard earlier, then it's not smart. Um, mm -hmm. And also there's been a real learning together. So, mm -hmm. you know, a key partnership was with the Ministry of Health. So 
they wanted a digital healthcare solution. They didn't really understand how it works. They didn't have a regulatory framework for it. They didn't have licensing arrangements. So we walked beside each other and we developed those frameworks together um, to get us to the right point. And I think for me at that point, it was making sure that we had a really robust regulatory framework because whilst we're the first digital care provider, we certainly won't be the last and there'll be others. And we had a duty of care as a private provider working with the government and Ministry of Health in Rwanda to make sure that that regulatory framework was robust and protected the government, it protected patients and it protected doctors. Um, and Fabio. so Great. all of these things were, were journeys together and, and, uh, and lots of stories, Anne and, and everyone else about uh, yeah, how you go about doing these things. Yeah, but very successfully. Tracy, you're covering a third of the Rwandan uh, po population, I believe, with, with this solution. So it is uh, really impressive. And um, that again, uh, these public-private partnerships, expanding the customer base by using different types of partners is absolutely key to scale. We've seen that in all digital solutions as well. Eh? So sure. that's a yeah. very nice example. Dr. Sujoy, uh, let, let us um, come back to you because I think you were, you were making the point of also a new type of partnership of how we can join forces in that federated learning and how we are now together, the uh, Apollo Hospitals, Microsoft and the Novartis Foundation are embarking on a new journey uh, in a, the first global data collaborative for cardiovascular population health, which is AI for better hearts. So can you explain us um, how you see that new types of partnerships there uh, to Joy? Right, I, I hope at this time that this works for me. Uh, I will give I'm you so a sorry. sign if we lose you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, my deep apologies, uh, you know, uh, for, for the connection. Yeah, I, I mean, it's been about three, four months that we have been actually working on this. Uh, one is, of course, to build the AI for better health, which is um, a partnership between the Novartis Foundation and Apollo Hospitals, where we are looking at, uh, you know, various data sets to actually improve on cardiovascular health, build a machine learning uh, algorithms, which will work at the last mile, which will work with uh, a module for clinician plus AI, where we will look at something where we have better interpretability, better explainability about the model of the cardiac health uh, at the last mile, um, uh, the, the AI CVD, where we found out that, you know, there are certain risk factors which are very, um, very much um, tuned to Indian population, you know, if you go around globally, you will not find power of AI is actually to take those local factors or local variables and um, integrate with an engine in such a way that it improves the accuracy and is applied as it's a global algorithm, uh, but uh, it is something which all, all works on a local scale. Uh, that is something which is uh, very, very important in, 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 in um, federated learning. Uh, and the one point that I missed out in making, uh, and at the time when I was uh, disconnected, you know, <clears throat> the, the whole algorithm which was built on Indian data performed so well in uh, European data from Maastricht University uh, with almost the similar amount of accuracy, which goes on to show that if we are using the AI, the power of AI, the power of federated learning, the concepts of algorithm moving to the data, we can actually do significant changes uh, in cardiovascular health and overall healthcare. Thank you, Sujo. This time we heard you and it was really great. Thanks also for the flexibility to find another connection. But um, absolutely, I cannot agree more that this, uh, this data collaborative offers a lot of opportunities to really address the, the burning questions in population health for many governments around the world and localize the responses to um, the needs on the ground. So that's really key. So maybe Mick, do you see an opportunity for bringing one of those kind, this kind of innovations we talked about, which are also featured in the report of the Broadband Commission? Can you see a an, an possibility of bringing one of those to a high income country like uh, the US? I would think that, um, you know, 
it's all just it's all just a matter of time. When I reflect mm -hmm. or you think about um, what's reflected in the report and examples from around the world, and we all realize that the technology is it's available pretty much mm -hmm. home, anywhere, at least where there's connectivity. And then if you point to a country like the US uh, that does have the resources, um, uh -huh. I think you're going to see the delivery. Um, however, the one thing I really reflect on, and this might be overly influenced by me working and having worked my career really within a health system is, you know, ultimately it's got to, well, first of all, the patients have to be willing to adopt it and use it. So it needs to be both, you know, usable and add the value that from a patient's point of view, you know, is, is palpable versus from, you know, the system point of view. And then secondly, that um, you can prove that it works, um, but ultimately it's going to be specific in its application. Um, and when you hear the work that goes into each of the clinical examples, I just touched on two, that we've been trying to apply this technology, you're talking months to years of work with multiple individuals to try to figure out answering one problem, but trying to do it really well. And so I think you can't just think of a vanilla approach in a lot of ways, although in some cases, like with Babylon in Rwanda, you can point to something where you can really get some scale, which is really quite powerful. Um, but at the end of the day, the impact of, our, and the proof in the pudding, as it were, just with the examples that we've shown ourselves that you can actually extend a care team in a powerful way. And I love this the feeling of like automated hovering, that a patient feels the security of knowing that, yes, they, they're very well aware they're inputting into a sort of a chatbot or some sort of you know um, automated person, mm -hmm. but they know what's behind it. And so they have comfort in knowing that that resource exists. And ultimately, it needs to be able to drive drive care. And I joked with our innovation team when I was learning about all of the work that's been done. I've seen a few presentations. You know, the U.S. is known for being a, a litigious culture. And I joked with them and I said, look at what we're doing now. How did you guys get this past our lawyers? Because what are we doing? We are using, you know, an automated device and technology via text to then, you know, ask patients questions, which ultimately, you know, we're accountable if something goes wrong. And one of the, the ways to kind of frame that whole thought process from kind of a U.S. point of view is that, you know, we're, we're actually doing more. So if you look at what the current standard is, and then you look at what the application of this technology can be, we're actually doing more. Um, we're actually further protecting or, or helping someone. And that really has been the frame that has helped, even within the organization, I'm just making a joke about our lawyers, but to really know that we ultimately can be accountable for what we're providing. Um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis this kind of extended automated tool. So I just, it's exciting. I think, you know, five to 10 years from now, it's, this will be much, much more common. Yeah, indeed. And, and your point on how important it is that, uh, that there is, um, that it's usable, both qua system, system needs and human resource mm -hmm. needs, would bring me back very shortly to you, Derek, before we potentially open for the floor. I see there's a few questions in the chat. But Derek, your role is really capability building in WHO for digital and um, AI cap uh, capacities or data science and AI capacities. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you proceed with that? Because the needs are you in low and middle income countries, not mm -hmm. only to upskill the workforce, but also the entire population. But if we took a look at the workforce, what would be the main steps to a country should undertake there? Very good, and very, very important subject. Um, putting people first is one of our key areas and uh, by people we include the population plus also the health workforce. I think as Mike was mentioning, uh, he made, made a remarkable point around uh, the user base and making sure that the user base is adaptable and the user base has uh, appropriate skills to actually use the digital tools that we're promoting. And COVID has underlined that because we're seeing more and more tools that require the patient to interact with the systems. And that on the other side, you need a capable health workforce to be able to relate, to be able to utilize, and also to be able to scale. And so one of the key issues that we are dealing with right now um, within the competency uh, program um, of our department is to really define the notion of um, you know, uh, capacity building uh, within the workforce that would include ensuring that we have um, a digital health competency framework that clearly articulates what kinds of uh, knowledge, cognitive knowledge you need health workers to have, 
what kind of attitudes you need them to have in terms of being able to relate to digital health and AI, machine learning and data, and what kind of skills, uh, whether these are ICT uh, digital skills or digital health uh, skills. So a framework that articulates that for the health workforce is critical and we're busy working on that. And at the same time, a framework that also touches upon the competencies expected of a citizen. Uh, with these two uh, approaches, uh, we really will be hitting directly the people-centered health service provision yeah. and also putting people first. Thank you, Derek. That's uh, really important and great to know that we are getting there and um, it will help a lot of countries. So I see the, the one question that is in the chat uh, has been addressed by Tracy, I feel, on uh, the regulatory uh, aspects of chatbots, for example. But uh, I think um, at the end of this discussion, it was so interesting how each of the six areas from the report have proven um, to be very, very important in each one of your your work, both the people and workforce, as Derek, uh, just the people first is absolutely key and how machines can complement people is absolutely important um, given the uh, unprecedented global health challenges we currently face. The second one on the, on the infrastructure needs, the data needs has been largely shown how important it is to have both uh, available, the governance and regulatory systems. Tracy, you really explained how important that overall public-private partnership was to get there, to make that regulatory uh, system ready to tap into the potential of its innovation. The um, design and the human-centered design, the needs-driven design, and the processes to integrate solutions into the system have been highlighted by each one of you. The, the need for partners, absolutely key, obviously, uh, in each of the examples that came out in the discussion today. So I think um, all of that really resonates very well with the work uh, done by the Broadband Commission for in this working group that consisted of uh, more than 60 experts in the field of um, digital AI in health. And uh, so definitely very, very useful to discuss this. But if I can ask uh, all of our, our panelists, maybe a, a three second answer on the last question, given that COVID catapulted us in this digital era where we use digital for many, many things we didn't use it before and specifically in healthcare has overcome the real, even the most skeptical resistance to use digital services. So if you can choose uh, one thing that will stick post COVID, what would it be? Maybe Derek, I give the floor your, to you first. Yes, thanks. Very and, short. And very short. Um, we like to say within universal health coverage, leave no one behind. We extend it by saying, leave no one offline. Leave no one offline. Yeah. And that means we need to make sure that we put people first. Great, great um, proposal, because that's definitely uh, also the call of the Broadband Commission. We need universal coverage, if, uh, connection, sorry, if we want to make sure that we achieve any of the sustainable development goals. And the digital divide, unfortunately, has become the phase of uh, inequity now. So we have to bridge that. Tracy, what would be your take on it? Um, I, I guess I'd, I'd build on um, Derek's excellent point, really, and say digital first. So um, I think we've there's been many skeptics of digital medicine, and I think COVID has forced us to move towards digital first. The government in the UK has 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 yeah. uh, gone the way of digital first. We're discussing um, exactly the same with the government of Rwanda. So for me, very simply, um, digital first solve as many problems as you can through digital mm. technology and leave face-to-face -face consultations for mainly secondary care or conditions where it's really needed. Absolutely. What about you, Sujoy? Uh, from a physician perspective, I would always look at clinician plus AI. Neither of them, you know, to be sidelined in this. There's nothing which is like, it's better than clinicians or it's better than AI. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's really beautiful. Um, humans plus AI make better outcomes for, for all of us clinicians. Mick, what would be your last take uh, that will stick after COVID? The virtual care models will become standard of care. Yeah. And part of the standard of care process. That's it. it took COVID to push 
and certainly the U.S. to push over the edge of what is obvious in many ways that we don't necessarily need to physically present for much of what was happening, and that it also allows us to extend our reach. Great, and we won't go back to the previous uh, way of working. Um, that's really a beautiful example. So with that, I think uh, we've come to an end of our uh, very interesting and rich discussion. Thank you so much to all of the panelists um, here with me. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, Rancel, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure if uh, you want to have some closing remarks. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you. And a big round of applause for everyone in the panel. Thank you so much. Well, Anne, I would like to thank everybody. And I found it a fascinating panel. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, the one, uh, I think, virtual is certainly here to stay. And in that context, I love the uh, comment by Derek that said, uh, there's everybody that will be, nobody will be held uh, offline. Everybody will be online. So uh, yeah. I thought that was terrific. And uh, I thought all of you were terrific. And thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to really learning more from the working group on the digital and AI and health, the re-imaging global health. I think it's terrific that uh, we can help you as well. So thank you very much. Great. With that, um, have a nice rest of the day, and I look forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.